Well, greetings, friends and neighbors, and welcome to yet another fall publishing webinar. I am Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazines and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we tackle today's topic, These Guys Suck. All right, now, lest you think I'm talking about that cheap competitor down the street or the uh, the last contractor you hired who left the job half done, uh, perhaps I should clarify that these guys are sucking insects, namely aphids and white flies, two of the most common insects you'll deal with throughout the season. Uh, it never hurts to uh, bone up not only on the basics of uh, these kinds of pests, you know, ID and things like that, but we're also going to bring you the latest in chemical and biological control information. And I say we, because as I always tell you, I am not the expert on the subject. However, I am an expert at finding experts. And I've got an expert expert for you today. He is Dr. J.C. Chong from Clemson University. Welcome, J.C. Hey there, Chris. How's the weather in Chicago? The weather in Chicago, I'd rather be outside today for a change, which I haven't been able to say for a while. How about And you are broadcasting from, from where today, my friend? I'm broadcasting in Florence, South Carolina. And uh, right now, I'm wearing shorts and t-shirts. The weather is nice. Uh, I just want to be out. Perfect. All right. Well, um, I should also mention that, uh, that JC is not only a noted associate professor uh, at Clemson, he also happens to be, I believe, our newest newsletter author and editor. He writes our Pest Talks newsletter, and I'll actually give you a little bit of uh, sign-up information about that. So, uh, so you may recognize his, uh, his, his name from that. So, uh, so welcome, JC. We're happy to have you on board today. Uh, me, well, you know me. I'm uh, broadcasting from the 412th floor of the Ball Publishing Towers, just west of Chicago. Uh, I, I certainly want to thank uh, this week's webinar sponsor, BASF, who helps put the free in free webinar. Uh, as always, if you uh, have questions, there's somewhere on your screen. I think it's off to the right, but I might be wrong. But somewhere, you'll find it. There's a, there's a place that lets you ask a question. Simple. Type it in. As we're going along, I'll be reading them, and if they're pertinent to what JC is talking about, I'll, I'll stop JC, and we'll, we'll, we'll put those questions out to him. If, uh, if we don't do it that way, we'll get to them at the end, and if there's anything that's just uh, too technical, complicated, or convoluted to handle on air, I'm going to provide some contact information for JC at the very end. And so you'll be able to reach him 24-7, 365. Uh, lastly, if you enjoyed the webinar and want to watch it again, if you had to leave halfway through because a customer came in or something like that, uh, or if you want to share it with colleagues, it'll be archived, as always, at the same place you signed up, which is growertalks.com slash webinars. And I think, JC, that's all my housekeeping, which means I'm going to turn the controls over to you, and you can tell us why these guys suck. Take it away, JC. Sounds great. Thank you, Chris. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, welcome to the uh, Four Properties webinar. And as Chris mentioned, we'll be talking about aphids and white flies today. And if you got anything technical or something that we did, did not get to answering on the webinar today, uh, please send me an email. Uh, I'll be able to answer you, uh, give you as much information as you want. All right. Well, let's get on to it. And uh, the first pest we want to talk about is the uh, aphid. Now, this is the season, as you know, that the aphids are going to become the biggest issue for us in the greenhouse growing business. And doesn't matter what you grow, you are probably going to get aphids attacking your plants at any time. All right, so the first thing I need to mention is identification of aphids. The identification of aphids is actually pretty important if you are thinking about doing biological control. Then I'll explain why in a little bit. But really, when it comes to identification of aphids, do not use the color of the aphid. If you call me up and say, oh, I got a green aphid, or if you call me up and say, oh, I got a pink aphid, I really don't know what they are because in most of the aphid population, there are a lot of different colors. Even within the same population, there are at least several different forms of color forms within the population. So when, for example, the melon aphid, as uh, shown in this picture, has green one, almost bluish one, and a yellow one. So if you call me about yellow aphid, it's going to be pretty hard to tell exactly what they might be. So do not use the color 
uh, to try to identify aphids at all. So, but for each different species, there are actually a lot of characteristics that you can use to actually identify them. So what I'm going to do next is go through very quickly a few of the more common species that we have. The first one is melanated, and some of them call them, uh, some of us call them uh, connated as well. So one of the uh, most distinguishing characteristics of the uh, melanated is that the cortical or the tailpipe are completely black. And if you look at the head between the two antennas, there's not really kind of any kind of indentation between the antennas at all. And also, a lot of time, what we are seeing is that the infestation by melanated usually starts on the lower part of the plant. Green peach aphid is not a very common species that we have. Now, different from melanated, the green peach aphid actually has an indentation between the antenna. It looks like somebody take a baseball bag and hit them in the head right there. So, make a dent right there. And if you look at the tailpipe or the cortical, they're only dark at the tip of the tailpipe. And usually what we're seeing is that infestation begins on the upper part of the plant, uh, different from the melanated. Now, the green peach aphid and the melanated are the two most common species that we have, but they are by no means the only species that we have uh, in the greenhouse. Uh, some of the locations, uh, particularly the northeast, you guys are probably dealing quite a bit with foxglove aphid, sometimes called the glass house potato aphid. Now, one of the most characteristic uh, of the uh, foxglove aphid is actually um, right next to their cortical. At the base of the cortical, on their body are actually two large green dots. Uh, those, uh, those green dots will tell you that this is a foxglove aphid. Pretty easy to identify. Another common species uh, around our area is the uh, potato aphid. Uh, this particular species has become more and more common on uh, tomato production, greenhouse tomato production, to be more specific. And they are probably one of the biggest aphids that we have um, uh, attacking plants in the greenhouse. And they are long, they are slender, and usually the legs have two different colors, and the body could be pink or green, uh, and then the, uh, the uh, cortical or the tailpipe are usually pretty long and completely black or completely uh, pink. So those are the four uh, species of aphids that we typically deal with in, on a daily basis. Now, it's not difficult to identify what you have on aphids. When you have aphids, you're probably going to know it. The most important, probably the most obvious symptom uh, of aphid infestation is uh, the pseudomone and the associated the honeydew. Honeydew and pseudomone come to, uh, go together and you're probably going to see them. And the aphids also shed their skin, and those skins often get stuck on the uh, pseudomon uh, and the honeydew. So giving the plants a little bit of a silvery looking color. And of course, uh, some of the aphids can also cause distortion in the plant tissue as well. So if you're going to look for the aphids, those are the signs that you could probably help you identify where they are. And once you get to them, take out your hand lens, Take a good look at the aphids and identify your species. All right, so there are quite a few issues with controlling aphids. There are a lot of difficulties with that, but one of the most important things, one of the most important challenges uh, in the southern production is that aphids keep coming in. These aphids have, they just keep flying in. As long as you have your uh, side panel open, they'll keep flying in from the outside, in and day out. So, Continuous migration has become a uh, pretty big problem for us. And the second problem is that the aphids, they just grow so fast and so many in this way, all the time. So uh, for a typical aphids, they usually complete that development in about seven days. And within the seven days period, they can produce a lot of young ones. So if you have a little, perhaps if you just have one aphid to start with, within a week, you are probably going to have two dozen aphids going around. So that becomes very, very important for you to actually find the infestation early and then take care of it very, very quickly uh, for you uh, not to have a big problem down the road. And the third problem with controlling aphids or challenging in controlling aphids is uh, in some situations, it becomes very challenging to deal with them, uh, especially in hanging baskets. So when you have hanging baskets, you hang it up there, you sort of forget about it, and then the aphids kind of infest them. All right, so when they got infested, them, it become very uh, uh, challenging. And years ago, many, many years ago, when we could still do it, 
Uh, neonicotinoid has always been a very good effective uh, option for controlling uh, the aphids. So if you drench your hanging basket up there with neonicotinoids, usually you're not going to have a whole lot of air aphid problem for a long time. Now that a lot of operations actually switch away from a neonicotinoid, we're starting to see that a lot of people are having aphids uh, issues on hanging baskets again. There are a lot of ways to actually controlling uh, aphids, and some of them may not involve neonicotinoids. So since, uh, since uh, a lot of operations switch away from neonicotinoids, we are seeing that the biological control has become more and more popular with a lot of folks. And for aphids, the good news is we have a lot of options when it comes to biological control. We have a lot of parasitoids, you have a lot of predators, and you have a lot of biopesticides that you can use to control all different kinds of aphid species. Uh, but this is when correctly identifying your aphid species is very, very important because not every parasitoid species will attack every single different aphid. For example, on the second row, you see Aphidia coromani. That particular uh, parasitoid species are most effective against creep fish aphids and melon aphids. But its close cousin, the Aphidia urbi, that one will be more effective against potato and foxglove aphids. So if you misidentify any aphid species and use a wrong parasitoid species, you basically cause the failure of the biological control uh, program. So identify your aphid species first correctly, and then you can pick the right control too for your aphid box problem. So let's look at some biocontrol agents. The first group are the parasitoids. So the parasitoids, the two major groups are the aphidias and the aphelinus. So these can also be purchased pretty easily and widely available. All right, so a lot of predators as well. There are some of the ones that are much more well-known, uh, shall we say. For example, the lady beetle. The lady beetle is pretty well-known, but not a whole lot of people are actually using them for biology control. Most of the folks, when it comes to using predators to control aphids, they usually go with the uh, green lace wing, uh, those creatures on the right hand side, and those uh, uh, things, and those uh, uh, predatory mites. Uh, so predatory mites uh, are the little maggots that will feed on the aphids as well. So there are a lot of biological agents for your aphids population, and one of the options in bio biological control of aphids that's gaining a lot of popularity is actually using aphid fungicide. There's quite a few suppliers that actually are producing aphid banker plants for use in the greenhouses, and they usually involve growing oats, infest them with bird cherry oak aphids, and then infest the aphids with some kind of parasitoid species. So you hang those uh, banker plants around your greenhouses, and the banker plants and the parasitoid will basically develop a population on the aphid species on this banker plant and spread out from those banker plants to control the aphid population you have in the greenhouse. So as you notice, the uh, aphid species that's used for the bank of plant is actually the bird cherry oak aphid. So unless you're growing grass, this is not an aphid species you need to worry about. So you don't, you don't have to worry about them ever getting onto your salvia or getting onto your basil or anything at all. So the aphid bank of plant has been used uh, quite, uh, quite successfully by a lot of operations. And one of the operations that use it uh, told me that they basically reviewed their yeah, spray program from about 20 spray per season down to two. So that's quite a bit of reduction. I'm very happy to hear that. So their aphids can also be controlled very successfully with uh, a lot of biofungicides, bio, bio pesticides, excuse me. So there are several different uh, bacteria and fungus species that you could choose from uh, for controlling aphids. You have uh, Bobella bartiana, which is the uh, botanical and microtrope. And uh, we have Isaria formosa here which is the uh, fungus, uh, the common name for that, the trade name for that is Ancora, also by the OHP. And on the bacteria front, you have uh, Chromobacterium, or Grandivo, or Venerate. Those are also registered to control aphids. So when it comes to biological control of aphids, or really for all any other, uh, any other pest species, uh, my suggestion is you need to start early. When the pest population is smaller, you will have a much better control uh, of the pest population with a biological control agent. And also the second thing to think about is if you are going to use uh, biological control, 
all the other insecticides you use in the greenhouse will have to be think about very, very carefully. You need to be using a lot of compatible uh, insecticides. Surely you don't want to release your lady beetles or anything at all and then spray something and kill off all your lady beetles. That's basically just uh, wasting your money. So there's a lot of information, uh, there's a lot of resources you can actually get to find out what is compatibility between your bio control agents and your insecticide and mycocide. Your supplier of biological control agents would be the best resource to go to them. So ask them, if I'm going to release the lady beetles or if I'm going to release the green lace wing, what insecticide should I, should I not use? So ask those questions before you start any kind of uh, biological program. So let's talk about insecticide. Uh, for chemical control a bit, there's a lot of options as well. And one of the big groups, one of the standby that we always use is the uh, systemic insecticide. As the name implies, systemic insecticide are the ones that you can apply as foliar or medium uh, drench or granular, and the root of the uh, of the plant will soak it up and bring it up to the rest of the canopy. We have quite a few options in that. Most of them are the, what we call neonicotinoid or IREC group 4A. Uh, this would include TriStar, Safari, Marathon, Flagship. And uh, some of the newer products uh, include uh, 4D, which is Altus, 23 group, group 23, which is Cantos, and group 28, which is Mainspring. Mainspring has a cousin called uh, Estalopren. As Salgren is registered to control aphids in the landscape and in series as well. So most of these systemic insecticide actually works quite effectively. As you can see from some of the summaries of IR4 trials, most of them achieve excellent control uh, in most of the trials. Uh, so they usually uh, are quite effective. So, but your question is going to be, well, I cannot use neonicotinoid. What other options do I have? So if your operation is limited by what you can use, particularly the neonicotinoid, there are some options as well. So Altus, Contone, and Mainspring are the three products that you can use that are not considered neonicotinoid. And they are usually quite effective against the uh, aphids across different species. Uh, JC, so let's before we go further, the yes. JC? Uh, I want to back us up. I'm going to back us up one. I just want to make sure the audience knows that the the letters, the P, E, F, and G. That's I think it means <laughs> poor, poor, fair, good, and excellent. And there's percentages down below. Is that what that, those correct. letters mean? Correct. That's correct. Okay. It's a, thank you for easy thank way, you for clarifying that. Easy way to glance at that chart and decide is you know is it nothing but P's? Maybe you know want to you know not depend on that one and, and look for the E's. You know those are going to be good. So okay, just um, and while we I'm not sure if, if it's the best spot to ask, but Linda's got a question, just sort of more basic aphid question, and she wants to know why do they seem to be attracted to the yellow flowers first in the greenhouse? Uh -huh. And I think that's because that's what allows us to use yellow sticky tape to uh, scout for them. <laughs> so, so it's a good thing, I guess, right? But what is it about Precisely. the yellow? Precisely. All right. So that's a very good question, Linda. So why is it? Why is it that uh, aphids are attracted to plants with a yellow flower? Well, as Chris mentioned, it is very much the same mechanism as they are attracted to yellow sticky bark. For the most part, for most of the uh, insects, including the aphids, Yellow is really a color that really attracts them. Um, as far as why that is the case, I'm not sure. So I need to look into that. But they are attracted to yellow, and therefore, uh, yellow flower a lot of times are uh, the ones that actually get more aphids uh, first. All right, very, very good. good. I'll, let you, question. I'll let you go on. There's your next slide. All right, so. So there are several, uh, uh, so next, among, among when I'm talking about AVIS, when I'm talking about white flies, when I'm talking about uh, in, uh, chemical control, I will also show you some of the uh, newer research data that we have gathered over the years. And some of them are my own, some of them are not. Uh, in this case, we're looking at outers versus uh, con uh, for control of AVIS on continualized hibiscus. And uh, for outers, uh, in this case, they actually use it for drench. So you have two treatments, the, the red line on the top, those are the untreated control, those are the ones that never have any kind of control.
going up. And then the uh, almost like a pinkish beige line uh, drains with outlets at 3.2 ounce per 100 gallon or 3.8 ounce per 100 gallon. So one thing I need to mention is that outlets is a new insecticide introduced by Bayer. And for them to control, uh, for, for, for the, the drink rate for aphid control using outlets is 3.2 ounce per 100 gallon. Uh, the 4.8 ounce per 100 gallon is a experimental rate. It is not a label rate, so do not use that in your, uh, in your control program. By the way, so the data uh, from Bayer basically shown that, <clears throat> as you can see, within seven days of the drench application, you have a significant reduction in aphid population, um, and that reduction basically are maintained up to 63 days after the application. So drench with uh, outers is actually quite effective. Now, um, I'm not going to talk more about uh, outers because I don't want to steal the thunder from some of my friends. And uh, in fact, two of them will give you uh, uh, um, some uh, more information about outers in Kanto in about uh, three weeks or so. Uh, so the next grower talk on uh, May 16, Kala Adesso and uh, Aaron, Aaron Palmatier will be talking about outers and contours and how to use them to control cancer and such an insect. So uh, register for that particular webinar and uh, let's listen to what they have to say about contours and uh, outers. Right, <clears throat> so outers is one of the uh, system insect sites that we have available. The other one is uh, Main Spring by Syngenta. Uh, this is a trial done by Dan Guerin up at uh, Formel Extension using Main Spring to control box of aphids. So a little bit of, uh, if you look at the, look at the chart, uh, the blue bars are the one that's untreated control. And in this case, uh, then actually make two applications, uh, two spray applications at 14 days in the bowl at four and eight to the down on the gallon. So you can see, as you can see, it doesn't matter what particular, uh, whether you're using spray or you're using drench, uh, they always, they reduce the aphid population significantly within six days of application. So um, if you make two spray with main spring, you add either four or eight fluid ounce, uh, they will provide you with protection to your plants as long as a drench with 12 fluid ounce uh, for at least uh, 28 days or 15 days after the second application. All right, let's move on. So. Those are the systemic insect sites that we can use for uh, aphid control. But we have other options for controlling aphids, and some of them are not systemic. And uh, some of these are some of the very uh, old stuff. For example, Seven, Warthin, Burst Pen, Power Star, uh, Schemidar, uh, Maverick Aquaflow, Avid. All these products are uh, registered to control aphids. And as you can see, some of them achieve pretty good efficacy. For example, Warthin. Uh, and also uh, Telstar actually give you good to excellent efficacy for controlling of the melanated phosphorus aphids and the uh, green peach aphids. And there are more. And some of your non-systemic insecticides are actually insect growth regulators. But these are the ones in group 7. Group 7A, 7B, 7C, which include NSTAR, Precrude, and also Distance. And this insecticide typically gives you decent uh, control of the aphid population. And another group are the group nine insecticide. Group nine insecticide uh, that would include Endeavor, Rycar, and the newest product called Endeavor. And you also have Hachi Hachi, uh, which uh, actually works very well against aphids. Uh, Aria has always been one of the very effective products in controlling aphids as well. Of course, you can also use oil, so. Uh, Neem oil uh, for, for aphid control, but some of the work has been done by R4 has not achieved very, very good efficacy uh, for aphid control using the oil and the soil. So one of the groups that I want to spend a little more time on is actually group nine. Group nine is a very unique group. Um, years ago, we actually called them, uh, we actually called them the feeding blockers, but it turns out that they are not exactly feeding blockers. They are actually a group of insecticides that would influence uh, the joint or one of the organs in the joint of the insect make them unable to move and unable to feed. 
So, I want to spend a little bit more time on this, and especially on one of the products called Ventigra. Hey, JC, hang on a second. Go ahead. JC, we're going to back up one more time because we had a couple of questions that came up. Uh, one specifically about the chart. Virginia wants to know if the uh, the what the blank results mean. Uh, was it were these uh, products not studied for these four aphids, or uh, or what's the situation where we have no letters? All right, that's a good question. Uh, can, thanks for catching that. I did not mention it. Yes, that's correct. If it's blank on the table, on the chart. That means IR4 did not study those particular products against those particular aphid species. We don't have data on those. Uh, there may be other data out there, but uh, as far as uh, the IR4 database is concerned, we don't have those data. I see. And Tim has a broader question about about any of these controls, systemic or non-systemic, uh, on uh, edibles. Uh, and in fact, Elaine just asked the same question about aphids on herbs, specific controls for uh, for food crops. Any recommendations, or do we where do we go for that information? Uh, very good question, Tim and Elaine. And uh, well, unfortunately, I'm not very well versed in the realm of controlling using insecticide for control for food crops. So. If Elaine and Tim can get in contact with me after the webinar, I'll be more than happy to look into it and provide them with the information. There you go. So you guys stick on, and we'll give you uh, JC's uh, email address at the end. All right, carry on, JC. All right, so uh, what was I saying? I was saying talking about Ventigra. Yeah, that's right. So Ventigra is a new insect site that's introduced by BASF in March of this year. So it's a brand spanking new thing. The uh, active ingredient is acetylpyrifene um, in the group 9D. It's not exactly a novel or new mode of action. It's in the same mode of action as Endeavor and Rypar, but it is in a different chemical class. And it has translaminar activity. It doesn't, uh, it's not exactly systemic. But if you apply it to the top or the upper surface of the leaf tissue, the active ingredients can actually penetrate the leaf tissue and go to the bottom of the leaf tissue and basically kill the aphid or white flies that are feeding on the bottom of the leaves. So uh, you would think, okay, well, it's translaminar, so you know, it's a little bit more forgiving. Yes, correct. But I would still recommend that you make a pretty thorough or very good coverage on your spray just to make sure that every surface is covered so that you can get the best efficacy. Now, uh, Ventigra is registered to control aphids, white flies, in about full scale. Uh, the rate for four different uh, test species is a little bit different. For aphids, the rate is 1.4 fluid ounce per 100 gallons, and white flies, nearly about in scale, those are 3.8 to 7 fluid ounce per 100 gallons. So there are some limits as far as how many times or how much you can actually use. Uh, Ventigra to con in your greenhouse operation. So you do not want to use more than seven, uh, 17 fluid ounce per acre per crop or 42 fluid ounce per acre per year. All right. So over the years, uh, BSF and I have been working on uh, several projects just to look at, you know, how well Ventigra actually uh, works against APHIS and white flies, really in scale. And so I'm just going to review a little bit of information that we have on APHIS and white flies in this paper. So the first thing I want to talk about is, okay, how does Ventigra actually stack up against all the other group nine compounds? Meaning how does it compare to Endeavor and how does it compare to Lycon? In fact, this is a study that we have just completed last week. The information is so new that BSM doesn't even have it yet. All right, so you guys are the first ones to hear about this. So we use all these products to control rose aphid uh, in the greenhouse. And we use uh, Ventigra and 1.4 fluid ounce per 100, right car at 3.2 fluid ounce per 100, and Endeavor at 5 ounce per 100. So as you can see on the chart, uh, both the Ventigra, um, Endeavor, and right car, we reduce a little bit of our aphid population within the first day of application. And over time, really, it doesn't matter which particular product that you use, they equally effective. But apparently, uh, it seems that Ventigra actually will give you a faster reduction in your aphid population and uh, keep it down for quite some time. 
The blue line is like if they untreated. So as you can see, if you don't treat them at all, the effect will go out of the water. So treat them early and treat them well. So in another study, we also look at ring features using them to uh, try to control them. And the first thing we try to compare is to look at, well, if we started with a light infestation, which is the uh, red line, and whether we can should control them when it's a heavy infestation. So which one should we go with? Should we catch them when they're early and try to control them that way? Or can we wait a little bit? So what we are finding out is that, well, it really doesn't matter if we use Ventigra at the right rate. It doesn't matter if it's a light infestation or heavy infestation. You can reduce the aphid population down to almost nothing within seven days of treatment. But if you control them early against a light infestation, you're probably going to have a much lower aphid population going down the road. So um, again, try to control your aphid population early, don't let them get out of hand. Another study that we looked at, also against uh, green peach aphid, is really uh, it try to answer the question, all right, if I'm going to make two applications of Ventigra, what should be my uh, reapplication interval? Should I do it every seven days? Should I do it every 14 days, 21 days, or 28 days? So we use that. Uh, we apply uh, Ventigra in 1.4 fluid ounce. And uh, when we compare that uh, against the efficacy of Marathon 2 branch, just to see whether we have a Ventigra at two applications going to get the same efficacy as the Marathon branch. As we, and what we are seeing is that, first thing is, it really doesn't matter when you apply Ventigra or how, uh, what is your reapplication interval of Ventigra. You will be able to achieve um, a good efficacy using Ventigra uh, just uh, similar efficacy as the Marathon too. So, um, so it doesn't really matter what particular uh, reapplication interval you use, but I would recommend that you probably apply them at 14 or 21, uh, 21 days after every application. Remember that Ventigra is as laminar, not the same. So it will protect the leaves that you have at the time that you make the application, but it will not protect the leaves that is new. So you want to make, make sure that your, uh, your, your new tissues are also uh, covered and protected by Ventigra. So, um, I would recommend that you make application every 14 days, uh, up to every 28 days. Okay, so I'm going to skip that. All right, so when it comes to controlling aphids, there are a few, a few, uh, a few uh, tips I can provide. The first thing is, the uh, most important thing is probably to know when the aphids actually showed up. Like I say, they have very, very fast reproduction and the population can get really big very quick. So you want to catch them coming in early and then treat them as soon as possible. Uh, the second thing is how you grow also makes a difference. And often, often over uh, fertilized plants, overly fertilized plants usually have the higher or greater aphid growth uh, than, uh, uh, than the regularly fertilized plants. So watch your fertilization. Too much of it is not always a good thing. So if you are going to use a uh, biological control, uh, you want to make sure that your aphid population, uh, your aphid species are identified. And you might want to think about the uh, banker plant system. It may be a worthy investment. And achieve coverage if you are going to spray. And then if you use uh, uh, adjuvant, it's probably going to increase your efficacy. And reapplication is definitely a needed thing, especially if you are going to spray. Drench one drench application probably will give you a pretty long term protection, but if you're going to spray, you want to make sure you spray uh, to protect the new growth, uh, perhaps every 14 days or every 21 days. And also because uh, aphids uh, have such short uh, population and they grow so fast, the chance of them developing insecticide uh, resistance is also very, very high. So you need to make sure that you rotate among different uh, insects at different modes of action to avoid the development of insecticide resistance. Okay, well, that's what I have for AFIT. And if you have any questions at all, just go ahead and put it on the check box and we'll go back, come back to it. All right, the second path is that I want to talk about is uh, white flies. And uh, of course, hopefully, 
you never have to face a situation where you have to deal with that many white lines. Um, not exactly fun to do. Similar to aphids, it's pretty important for you to identify what particular white fly species that you have because uh, different biocontrol control agents will actually deal with different aphid, uh, white fly species. Uh, you can identify the white flies based on the adult characteristics. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it because really, in most of the greenhouses, the one species that we deal with is the uh, sweet potato white fly, the uh, biotype or the cube biotype. So those are the one species that we typically deal with, and uh, they could be most most easily identified based on the pupil um, the characteristic. The um, Greenhouse white flies or the bandolin white flies, they typically have a much, they have a pupil that have more of a vertical edge and longer hair. But the uh, uh, sweet potato white flies pupae actually looks like gumdrop. So uh, they look a little bit different. So what about cute white flies? Yeah, there's quite a few uh, quite a few things about cute white flies that was popping around uh, for the past few years. What about them? Well, the Q biotype, if you haven't heard it, I use other, it's the biotype of sweet potato white flies that actually are resistant to a lot of insects like that we use. And if you have a population that don't seem to respond to just about anything you throw it, including your chicken thing, then you probably should look at them and see where they are. So the Q biotype white fly. Uh, the best way to do it is actually do a genetic test. You cannot identify, you cannot distinguish a Q, Q biotype from a B biotype based on morphological characteristics. So if you suspect you have Q biotype, collect some of the specimens and send to Dr. Cindy McKenzie uh, for her to uh, biotype that for you. And it's probably a good idea for you to email her first and to see whether she's available to help you do that. For the white flies, it's very important to, for you to figure out when they actually come in. Now, did you know that we do not have two little white flies hanging out all the time? In fact, most of our sweet potato white flies come in from somewhere. And in the, in the winter, we do not have a population that sustains itself on the outside. So a lot of the white flies actually come in as cuttings or come in from some other environment after they build up the population. So if you want to find the white flies population, uh, sticky card is probably one of the best ways to do it. And of course, you can also flip over the leaves to look for the nymphs, look for the pupae, look for the adult, and look, also look for the uh, sooty boat and the uh, honeydew as well. So as I said earlier, um, most of the white fly population that we have actually come in from the cuttings that we receive. And because of these cuttings, it's very important for you to actually think about them. Uh, make sure you've got clean cutting from your suppliers and also inspect the cutting as they're coming in just for the white fly pupae or adult or even the eggs population. And so controlling um, your, off, your, your white fly population on your cutting is probably the first step in achieving a good white fly IPM program. And some of the work that Dr. Rose Buderhaus and uh, Michael Brownbridge in Rhine, uh, Rhineland uh, Horticultural Research Center was showing is that if you dip the cutting in 0.1% horticulture oil or a combination of 0.5% insecticide and soap and propena bacchiana, which is uh, the penny guard, you can actually reduce the white fly population by 72% after the two weeks, after you're sticking it. So if you having consistent white fly problem coming in from a green, uh, cutting, it's probably a good idea for you to do a cutting dip just to clean up the uh, cuttings before you let them stick into the pot. There are also a lot of biological control agents uh, to control white fly. Uh, similar to aphids, some of them are parasitoid. Some of them are predators, and some of them are the fungi and bacteria that can kill the white fly pupae in the mouth. So over here, again, like I said earlier, you need to make sure that you identify your white fly species correctly. If for the greenhouse white flies, your option is in Casa Formosa. If you have sweet potato white flies, your options for parasitoid may be very monstrous species. Those would work very well. Right, so the uh, Aramosaurus species is probably one of the most common white fly biological agents that are using now. So I'm using those to control the sweet potato white flies. And they usually come in in a little cart like that. On the cart, you're going to have a lot of, you know, in the middle of the cart, you're going to see a lot of black dots. 
those black dots are actually parasitized pupae of the white flies. So if you hang those uh, little cards around your greenhouse, and the parasitoids are going to emerge from those pupae and spread all over the greenhouse. So it's a very efficient way for you to actually spread the uh, parasitoids out into the greenhouse. There's a lot of biocontrol agents, a lot of predators you can use for controlling uh, white flies. Ambrosia swirsky is probably one of the very popular uh, predatory mite species that we have now. You can use them to control the eggs and the young, uh, young uh, larvae of the uh, white fly. And the lady beetle, Theophastus, is also very popular. And there's a predatory bug called Dicyphus that you can also use for controlling white fly population. For chemical control, uh, similarly, you have systemic insecticide. Systemic insect, again, you can use it for fungi spray, medium drench, or you can spread them out like granular. So similar to the table that we have seen earlier with, uh, with aphid, um, these, all these data uh, are come from uh, IR4 drops. You have P for full, F for fair, G for good, and E for excellent. If the, the cell is blank, that means we do not have the information about this. But as you can see, uh, most of the neonicotinoids, things like Safari, Marathon, and Flexion, are generally effective or good against uh, the swift state white light as well as the greenhouse white light. And the replacement for the neonicotinoids, for example, Altus, Contos, and Mainspring, they are also good to excellent when it comes to controlling uh, white light population. So this is again come from uh, Bayer. Uh, it's data that they have for controlling white flies using drench of altus at 3.2 ounce per hundred gallon or 3.8 ounce per hundred gallon. So as a reminder, the uh, label rate for drench of altus is 3.2 to uh, 3.2 ounce per hundred gallon. So 4.8 ounce is the experimental rate to use that. So as you can see, uh, with one drench of altus, you can actually reduce the uh, white flies uh, larvae population significantly compared to the antenna control for at least 42 days after treatment. If you are using mainspring, it's equally effective. This is a study done by Lance Osborne down in the uh, University of Florida. Uh, again, the blue bars are the untreated. As you can see, from, zero, uh, from week one all the way to week eight, you actually have a much, much, much lower Wi-Fi populations on uh, plants treated with mainspring compared to the one that's not treated. So the one treated with mainspring uh, at either two spray at 14 days or once uh, one drench at eight pounds or three pounds, they are equally effective. Uh, you're not going to see any uh, white flies on those high biscuits until about eight weeks after the treatment, which is a uh, pretty long-term systemic control. For the uh, non-systemic insecticide, you also have a lot of good options, uh, things such as uh, uh, dirt spray. Uh, Things uh, with uh, insect growth regulators such as NSAR as well as the uh, RICAR, they all give you excellent control of the white fly population. Again, I would like to spend, oh, there are more uh, options for you uh, when it comes to non sustainable insects. Uh, TALIS, which is an insect growth regulator, has given you pretty good effective control for greenhouse and superficial white fly. But notice those uh, chemicals that have a uh, cross uh, mark on them for things like, for example, pedestal, pallet. These are the insecticides that you should not be using if you are uh, dealing with acute biotype. Right, so let's look at Ventigra. So how does Ventigra uh, uh, deal with white flies? I well, would say doing quite well. And in one of the trials that we are doing is to compare different application rates and also different uh, application frequencies and compare it to main spring. So as we can see, one application of Ventigra at 4.8 or 6.8 fluid ounce, um, and also two applications of Ventigra at 4.8 or 6.8 fluid ounce gives you a comparable uh, efficacy as main spring applied at four fluid ounce one time. So uh, effective uh, control is definitely could be achieved with uh, Ventigra uh, using either one time at 4.6, 4.8 fluid ounce or twice at 4.8 fluid ounce.
Okay, so what are the tips when it comes to controlling Wi Fi? Again, stay vigilant uh, because the Wi Fi is constantly coming in on your cutting and constantly coming in from the outside if you're missing this out. So you want to make sure you use a sticky card to monitor the population. If you start looking, uh, if you start finding really uh, white flies on the sticky card, it would be a good idea for you to start treating the uh, white fly population. And also, cutting dips uh, is really one of the first steps that you need to, need to be taking in your white flies management program if most of your white fly population come in through the cutting. It's very easy to do, and in fact, you can find a video on how to do that. All right, so uh, if you're going to do biological control, make sure you identify your white fly species correctly. And biological control is actually a very good solution if you are dealing with two biotypes, where you cannot use a lot of insecticides to control those white fly populations. All right, here's a good resource for you uh, to, to think about what kind of insecticide you might want to use for the white fly. And you can find that online uh, by Googling MREC white fly. And you'll bring right, right up to that document. It's prepared by that Dr. Lance Osborne in Florida, and it basically lists all the insecticides uh, for B and Q biotype control and whether they are effective or not. So I find that particular uh, document quite effective, uh, quite useful in uh, a white fly developing a white fly management program. So if you are going to use biological control, uh, be careful what you are using uh, as far as the insecticide is concerned. Use only comparable insecticides. And if you need to use insecticide to reduce the white fly population before you start a biological program, also use a comparable insecticide. Because white fly actually feeding under, uh, under the leaves, uh, you want to make sure you achieve full coverage uh, with your spray. And if you use the back then, you probably will get a much better efficacy to that. And insecticide rotation is a must with uh, white fly because they develop very, very fast. And as demonstrated by Q biotype, they can develop insect side resistance very, very quickly uh, and become very, very difficult to control. So make sure you rotate your insect side. Uh, make sure you do that frequently and make sure you do that uh, religiously. That would be one way for us to avoid a lot of trouble down the road. Okay, then that's all I have for white flies and aphids <laughs> today. I think that's plenty, JC. I greatly appreciate it. Um, we uh, actually we we fielded some good questions on on aphids, but nobody's got any questions on white flies. So if, you, if you've got a couple seconds here to type one if in, if you have one, um, I wanted to uh, say two things, uh, JC. First, thanks for the uh, the update on the new product, uh, Ventigra. And I think we'll be looking for more information as the research is done on that one. And then that. Um, that earlier slide that you showed at the beginning of the uh, white fly section with the infestation on the back of that poinsettia leaf, uh, I think you shot that one in my greenhouse back at about 1988. It still gives me nightmares. So well, thanks for you that. Should, you, you should come to my greenhouse as well. Just look at what, what kind of waste it populates. No, thank you, boy. We we had we had orthene and we had temic back then, and pretty much nothing else. So thank goodness the uh, the uh, chemical companies are doing such a a, a good job. Um, let's go back. We do have a question from uh, Virginia. And she says, I thought I saw a rise in aphid population on the uh, Ventigra graphs after the second application. Is that due to the rapid development uh, or population turnover um, or a rapid selection slash attempt for resistance? Hmm. I didn't quite catch that, Chris. Would you repeat that again? Well, we'd have to go back to the graph you showed about um, uh, uh, Ventigra on aphid. And she says that it looked like there was a, an actual rise in the aphid population after the second application. I don't know if you can recall that. It might be one we need to field uh, uh, offline, as they say. All right, that would be, I need to look at that graph again. I'm not entirely sure what uh, Virginia was talking about, but I'll look at it again and we can chat. And okay, I'll sure. got my email, so she can get me. 
<laughs> All right, I'll share that one with you afterwards. Uh, Sherry wants you, uh, she enjoyed this enough. She wants you to speak on Western flower thrips and mealybugs. So we'll have to schedule, we'll have to schedule one on those guys, won't we? All totally. right. Well, <laughs> and talk about uh, mealybugs. That's my favorite. Be careful oh, what you're going to get. Job. <laughs> oh boy, is it my uh, my wife's house plants after the winter time? You know, in Chicago. Oh boy, they just come out of nowhere. So another one that haunts me. All right. Well, if you have more questions, uh, you can email JC at uh, there's his address J U A N G H C at Clemson dot E D U. I got that one correct there, JC. Right. That's Lots right. of letters. Okay. Not. Uh, uh, That'll get that'll uh, get him twenty four seven, and if you um, you should if you don't already subscribe to JC's Pest Talks uh, e newsletter. It comes out every two weeks, twice a month. Uh, JC, how long have you been doing this for us now? I know it feels like forever, but well, I've been. <laughs> this would be my second year, I believe. Second year, That's and right. it seems it seems like you're enjoying. It. I tell you what. This is a this is a tough newsletter. It's the last one we launched uh, because it's so hard to find, you know, an entomologist, an expert on pests who can do it in an interesting way. And I tell you, if you read it, you'll find out it's not only really informative, really interesting, but it uh, it's also pretty funny too. So that's that's fun. what's that? Is that a cricket going off there, JC? Oh, that's actually my phone. I can just ignore it. <laughs> it, it is a cricket, isn't it? Unless that's the noise that it, it, is it a made. I should right. have known. And hey, I told you. I told you he has a sense of humor. Anyway, all right. So, well, so sign up for if that. You, if, right. If you don't get enough of it, you can always sign up for that. <laughs> and as I said, this webinar will be archived as soon as I can manage it. If you want to go back over it or share it with colleagues or get back into some of those charts, they'll all be out there. You go to the same place you signed up, growertalks.com slash webinars. And definitely one last shout out and thank you to BASF, our sponsor. For today's webinar, they put the free in free webinar. And so that said, well, I want to thank uh, JC. This is a good time. Let's let's do it again, my friend. Uh, I want to thank JC and all of his sucking pest friends. And for all of my Stellar Ball Publishing staff who definitely do not suck. In fact, they're the best in the business. This is Chris Beatty saying so long, everybody.